I just wanted to thank you all for being here. So I'm Jane Woodward. I created The Foster. It was a crazy, wonderful idea that happened on the San Juan River back in uh, 2011. And something really important to me, once we got the physical space of The Foster built, and these beautiful exhibitions of Tony's journeys, exploring beauty and sacred places of the American Southwest, a really important thing for me was to bring together, one by one, with you, people who've traveled with Tony. Tony lives in Cornwall, England, a little far away. We can't bring him here all, every week, every month, excuse me, to talk to you about his journeys. But there are remarkable people who played a role in Tony's career. And when we can schedule them and bring them here to share them with you, it's a really great opportunity to hear stories. And fundamentally, part of what hooked me into loving Tony Foster's work is I feel like his journeys tell a story of being out in wilderness. And we have these wonderful people who either have traveled with Tony physically on a journey or they've played an important role in his career. So tonight we have someone special, Alan Peterson, who's come all the way from Flagstaff, Arizona, where he's the curator of the Museum of Northern Arizona. And I had the privilege of meeting Alan for the first time in 2013 when Sacred Places of the American Southwest, which is on exhibition here and is property of the Foster, of the foundation that underlies the Foster, before it came here, it opened, really. At, after opening at the Gerald Peters Gallery in Santa Fe, it showed, at, at, with Alan as curator, at the Museum of Northern Arizona, where the community there was thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have it. So that's when I first got to know Alan, and we've continued uh, a really friendly dialogue. He's been teaching me about art of the Grand Canyon and artists who have painted it other than Tony Foster. Some of you may not know, the more I spend thinking about Tony's work, and it's, sometimes it's fun to share uh, little pieces that people may not know, but out of the over 500 paintings Tony has made in his 16 journeys, the single subject he's painted most is uh, the Grand Canyon. And so, uh, and Flagstaff, Arizona is one of the gateways to the Grand Canyon, and so Allen's Museum plays a really important role in connecting people to the Grand Canyon geographically and to its, uh, its human history as well. Uh, and I think some of you know that the 100th anniversary of the Grand Canyon is, is right upon us, and Alan will probably touch on that. So I think before Alan steps up here, I guess there's one... Um, other thing I'd like to make a pitch for, which is I am thrilled you're all here tonight. Alan's talk is going to end up on YouTube, and I know we're all going to love it. And one of the favors you could do for me personally is to continue to do what many of you have been doing, which keep keep bringing your friends to the Foster, but also go to our website and go to your YouTube, the YouTube channel for the Foster. And if you enjoy the talk tonight and some of the other ones you've heard, Capture that link and send it to someone you know and say, gosh, I heard this fabulous guy, Alan Peterson, talk about his relationship with Tony. This story might really interest you, even if though you're not in Palo Alto, where the foster exists, part of what we like doing is, is enlarging our virtual connection to people who care about art and wilderness, Tony's work. And uh, I got off track talking about the fact that, as I think some of you know, we have, we have the My Journey with Tony speaker series, but we also have the Guest Artist Explorer speaker series. And one of what's, you're in store for a real treat because Alan has been on a journey with Tony Foster, but he is an artist in his own right. And so he's gonna talk a bit about his role as an artist and his journey with Tony all at once. So you're kind of getting a twofer. And with that, <laughs> with a drum roll, I am thrilled, tickled, etc to have Alan Peterson join us tonight to share his story of knowing Tony Foster for many years. Thank you, Alan. Welcome. Thank you, Jane. Um, well, welcome and thank you for coming and join us, joining us this evening. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, Tony uh, truly is a kindred spirit for me, as you'll see. And Jane, thank you for the invitation um, and your generosity. It's great to be here. And it's great to be part of this endeavor. You know, there aren't a lot of museums and foundations dedicated to individual living artists. And this is really a pretty unique situation here. Uh, and it's, it's, it's truly um, an honor to be a part of it. 
And it's, and it's really an honor to be able to do what I do. I, a couple of years ago, I had this realization. I was, I was working on a project uh, for a book that never got published, but oh well. Um, and, I, and I realized that I've, I've actually had a career in art about the Grand Canyon. And it struck me, and, and I think since that day, I've just really been grateful for the opportunity to, to have led a life, uh, not only as an artist and a, a teacher and a curator, but also um, as somebody who's been able to, to make a career about the Grand Canyon. Um, and so we'll talk about that too. So I, was, I, I grew up in San Diego. And I think that a really formative experience for me as an artist and as a kind of somebody interested in culture in the broadest sense was my education began at a community college. I teach at a community college today because I went to community college. And I think that I always sought to emulate what my teachers gave me. And um, so here's the title. Uh, this is a geological map of a section of the Grand Canyon. In my early education, learning about contemporary art, my teachers had connections with and, and shared and really gave me a love for artists like John Baldessari and Robert Irwin and Ed Ruscha. And although it doesn't directly look like that in my art, um, that kind of conceptual view of art really shaped how I make and view the world of art. And I really liked some of the artists working in the 70s, 60s and 70s, doing what was referred to as earth art, uh, people like Richard Long. And uh, I put this pretty long quote up there, which I realized is kind of a long quote. So I like the fact that people like Richard Long and um, Hamish Fulton were doing things with nature that were very unlike the art of the 19th century, where artists, uh, particularly the artists of the Hudson River School, kind of taught us how to appreciate nature here in America and encourage people to get out into nature. But I really like the kind of conceptual nature of this artwork, and I like the, the fact that it was kind of documentary also. And so when I learned of Tony Foster, uh, I, I really, I felt a kinship almost immediately. Uh, because I had also done a few things uh, that had maps incorporated into them at this point. Uh, you know, but I was like 20 years old, I think, something like that. Um, well, actually, no, when I first saw this work of Tony's, I was probably um, 25 or something like that. And I became acquainted with Tony and this work of art because we were both in an exhibit in Yosemite. Uh, it was called Yosemite Renaissance, and I think that program is still going on uh, in the valley. And I was really struck uh, by not only Tony's painting, but also how he incorporated all these various components in that really give a sense of place. And for myself as an artist, that's really important. And, I, and that's what I liked about Long and Fulton was how they sought to really give you a sense of their experience in this you know, remarkable place that they were documenting. And I was, I was not only struck by Tony's painting, but also by the fact that he got first prize. <laughs> and I only got an honorable mention. And this is the painting that I had the exhibit, and I apologize, it's, a, it's a, a not a very good scan from a very old <clears throat> 35 millimeter slide. But it's a large watercolor also. It's actually not too much smaller than this projection, projected image here. It's about a six foot painting. Um, of the Clark Range looking from the east towards uh, in the direction of Yosemite Valley. But after, and I searched like heck for the catalog from this exhibit because I wanted to bring it in to share it with you and I couldn't find it, but uh, I know I still have it. But at any rate, once I saw Tony's work, I immediately was attracted to it and immediately recognized what he was doing and began following his career um, as my own was really kind of getting launched at that time. In, uh, in 19, uh, oh, oh yeah, okay, and then uh, I, I put this in because it's kind of from, uh, from my neighborhood. Um, I like the fact that he's really telling us about the place and what it means to be there. And, and you know, as, as you walk through the Foster, 
That's what every one of these paintings is about. It's about the, the visual experience, but it's also about all of the other sensory experiences associated with that place. And I think that that kind of in-depth being with a capital B or sense of place with a capital P, you know, I, I haven't traced it back much further, but certainly it has origins or uh, has a connection with Henry David Thoreau and the transcendentalists who, you know, really advocated for a personal relationship with nature. Uh, oh, and th then I, I just realized this morning, <laughs> Uh, I was trying to think of other ways that I, I, I connected with Tony. And another big connection that we have is the Swedish-American painter Gunnar Wiedfors, who worked here in the United States during the 1920s and 30s. And this is one of Gunnar's paintings of the inner gorge of the Grand Canyon from above Phantom Ranch. And if you've ever been to Phantom Ranch, you might you know, recognize this, this portion of the canyon. And I know that Gunnar is a major inspiration for Tony, and Gunnar has always been a big inspiration for me, and I'm currently working on a book about Gunnar Weedforce, and will next year publish a catalog raisonné of his paintings. Uh, but this is one of his many remarkable works of the Grand Canyon, and another point of connection with Tony. So in 2005, I, I had the great honor of being taken on as the curator of art at the Museum of Northern Arizona, uh, which was founded in 1928. Has anybody been to the Museum of Northern Arizona in Flagstaff? Oh, good. Okay. Um, well, it too really struck a, a resonant chord with me because I've always been very interested in science, as you'll see, and I've always been very interested in the intersection uh, and the union of science and art. And I've done a number of works and been in a number of exhibitions that looked at the relationship of art and science. Um, the founders of our, the co-founders of our museum were a painter, Mary Russell Farrell Colton, uh, who was very much interested in the place of, you know, I mean the region, but the places that make up the Four Corners region on the southern edge of the Colorado Plateau. And her husband, Harold Colton, was a scientist, a, a biologist. And so my museum has always had this dual mission of art and science. So I felt and feel very much at home there. And I think, too, that that's a natural place for Tony because there is an underlying current of science in Tony's work. It's not as explicit, maybe, as it is in mine, but you know, it's certainly there. And so, oh, and I was gonna say, we just opened, um, this is our museum's motto, which I think really nice, kind of nicely sums that up. Um, earlier this year, we just opened a new gallery called Native Peoples of the Colorado Plateau. And uh, on, the, on the left over there is um, Jones Benally, who's a Navajo, um, you know, the common term is medicine man. Uh, and uh, an artist, and he's speaking at the opening of the new gallery. So the museum is very much about place, you know, the, the southern Colorado Plateau, the native people who've lived there for many centuries, uh, and then the science of the understanding of the plateau. So it was natural to try and bring Tony's work there, and as Jane said, in 2013 we presented uh, watercolor diaries, sacred places of the Southwest. And it was really a, a wonderful experience for me to work with Tony uh, and Jane on this exhibition. This is a view of the installation. And here we are, I think this is the Thursday or Friday night before the exhibition opened. And there's Tony. This is, this is outside the founder's house. Uh, we call it the Colton House, and it's a kind of a classic um, you could call a southwestern uh, arts and crafts style house. So he had just come down from the South Rim and brought the painting with him. So my journeys are, I would like to say inspired by Tony's work. They're not inspired by his work, but they're certainly parallel. And Tony has certainly been an inspiration and influence in terms of his kind of documentary uh, approach. And something that I've always been interested in is nuclear power and 
atomic weapons and kind of the whole industry, kind of the whole, uh, the whole kit and caboodle. And it's been an interest of mine since I was eight years old. And in the 1990s, I did some paintings um, of the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in southeastern Washington. Maybe you know the story of that um, industrial development and the toxic legacy, I think we can say, that's been left. And about three years ago, I started thinking about kind of going back to that subject in regards to the Grand Canyon. And initially, I was going to paint mines and uranium mills and the facilities. But as I was doing the research and kind of starting to you know, locate subjects, I discovered really some very interesting geological features called breccia pipes. And I'll show you a picture of a breccia pipe here in a minute. But if you see all the little yellow dots on this map of the Grand Canyon, each dot represents a breccia pipe. And in the Grand Canyon region, breccia and breccia pipes are the source of the uranium that's been mined there, and the source of the uranium that people would like to mine. Uh, so you can see they're literally all over the place. So a breccia pipe is a vertical geological structure with its base in what's called the Redwall Limestone in the Grand Canyon. Redwall Limestone was laid down about 350 million years ago um, during the Mississippian period. Uh, this followed what was known as the Age of Fish, the Devonian uh, era. And um, Redwall Limestone is a very pure, fine-grained limestone. And shortly after it was laid down, it forms approximately a 500-foot cliff through much of the Grand Canyon. So this blue band is roughly 500 feet thick. And after it was initially laid down, solution caverns formed. Uh, you know, like um, Mammoth Caves or Carlsbad Cavern. And those caverns collapsed. And when those caverns collapsed, everything above them collapsed along with them. And so there was kind of a domino cascade, domino effect and cascade of all the rock layers above collapsing down and creating basically a cylindrical vertical chute, so to speak. And over time, that pipe, this vertical chute, also became a channel for groundwater. And over hundreds of millions of years of groundwater flowing through these structures, they deposited minerals. And among the minerals they deposited were uranium-associated minerals. And to give you kind of a larger sense, if you look at the diagram over here, you can see that this kind of shows uh, the way that they kind of are distributed throughout the strata in a section of the canyon. So I became utterly fascinated by these. I had no idea they existed before. Um, what I like about them is that they're very subtle in their landscape expression. And so a little bit more about that later. So what is breccia? Breccia is a kind of like conglomerate, rock that's been cemented together by minerals forming this kind of chunky conglomeration of bits and pieces cemented together. So this little chunk right here is located at the type of, top of this. Can you see the, my little red dot there? OK, so you see the V right here? So that's the, that's the kind of exposed upper portion of this pipe. And this whole structure goes all the way down almost 1,000 feet, OK? So I set out two years ago uh, on my first journey looking for uranium in the Grand Canyon region. And I decided to visit these places on, by, either by bicycle or by foot. Why by bicycle, by foot? To kind of approach the landscape on its own terms. And there's a great quote by Ernest Hemingway, maybe you know it. Uh, to paraphrase the quote, he said that the best way to learn a country is to ride a bicycle across it, because you'll really, truly learn the landscape. So this I did. So um, I recorded all these journeys using GPS software, and I've created maps from that software. And this is one of the first ones that I did, if you see the track, uh, on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. 
And to give you a sense of what we're looking at, this is an example of the surface expression of a brechet pipe. So some are made visible by erosion in the side of a cliff. Some are visible only by virtue of the fact that they leave a very shallow depression on the surface of the, of the, of the ground. Uh, something that looks like when there's a big rainstorm, it creates a big puddle, you know, something like that. So can you spot that here? Okay, so this is, this is it right here. So what I really love about this is two things. One is that often merely saying uranium makes people anxious. Try it sometime. But what I also really like is the fact that right beside the Grand Canyon, which is over the edge over here, is this ridiculously subtle, nuanced landscape feature that looks like a place that becomes a puddle. So you've got one of the greatest landscapes on Earth with one of the most non-landscape features right beside it. And you know, millions of people a year come to visit the Grand Canyon, and something like this would go completely unnoticed, unless you mention the word uranium. So I'm doing drawings, and these are pretty terrible slides. I have to apologize. Um, it turns out that photographing a graphite drawing is a bit more of a challenge than uh, I was up to at the time that I had these photographed. Uh, so I got some better photos, but so I'm doing, I'm doing drawings. When I visit the pipes, I do a, a very quick field sketch, take photographs, and then I go back to my studio and I do the finished drawings there. And I've got some better examples than this one. But here's an example of a drawing I did at the, at the site that I just showed you the photograph of. And so I'm doing these on, on large sheets, and I'm doing six drawings on a sheet. So this is a little bit better representation. Uh, and you know, like Ed Ruscha's 34 parking lots, to some extent, this is about the sheer number of them as much as it is about the subtle nature of the landscape feature. And there are people involved. You know, there were mines up around the Grand Canyon, and these are some fellows that worked in this place called the Hack Canyon Mine uh, in the 1960s. And I just can't even quite hardly imagine doing that for a living. But uh, they would drive about an hour from Fredonia uh, up on the Arizona Strip to work in the mine. And they look like quite the crew, don't they? Um, so there are currently no active uranium mines at the Grand Canyon. But uh, in, this, in this map, you can see a place labeled Pine Nut and Arizona One. And these are both uh, mines that uh, were active recently. One is on standby currently waiting for the price of uranium to go back up to make it economically viable. The other one is actually being dismantled because they've mined out the ore in that particular pipe. So the way that they mine them is they sink a shaft down beside the pipe and then they basically make circular um, galleries around it to get at the ore. So I also set out on foot, and one of the hikes that I made was to a place called the Kaibab Pipe. And if you've been to the Grand, how many people have been to the Grand Canyon? Everybody been to the Grand? Good, okay. Well, if you haven't been, you've got to get there. So, um, so this is the south room of the Grand Canyon where the hotels and all the tourist facilities are. And the Bright Angel Trail, uh, which is one of the trails to the uh, Colorado River, goes down this way. And I walked off the trail, I left the trail at this point, and traveled along this ridge to view what's called the Kaibab Pipe. And you can, this is actually a pretty great representation of one that's been exposed by erosion. If you look right up here, you see this little white vertical, it's kind of a thumb sort of a structure. You can also see this little dip in the bed right here. So that dip is the result of all those layers collapsing downward in the initial collapse of the, of the vertical structure. Now what's, the irony I refer to is actually visible here because the Kaibab Trail is another one of the main trails that goes from the rim down to the Colorado River. 
And the Kaibab Trail passes right by the tip of this breccia pipe right over here. So uh, when I was here drawing, there were hikers walking along this ridge. And none of them would have had any idea that there was a uranium bearing breccia pipe right there, unless they'd actually you know, done some research with such a thing in mind before they set out. So I did a drawing there and hiked back out. And this is the not very good large scale version of the photograph of the drawing. So the beauty of this too is it gives me a great excuse for going to some very remote places in the Grand Canyon. And if you've been to the Grand Canyon, you probably went to where the El Tavar Hotel or the Bright Angel Lodge is, or maybe you went to the North Rim. And while on the one hand it kind of goes without saying, most people don't realize that the Grand Canyon is far larger than that little view that you get you know, in that you know, popularly visited region. So the canyon's 288 miles long. And I love the more remote places because you can go for days without seeing another person. So these are, uh, these are three bicycle rides that I did um, over the last year. Um, this one along the ridge above National Canyon. This one above the ridge on a ridge above Mohawk Canyon. And then one over here down to a former mine called the Ridenauer Mine. And this is a view, this is another view of that initial pipe that I showed you. You can see the, this little vertical V cut over here. And so this is an example. So there are 1,300 of these pipes. And of that 1,300, probably only 20 have actually been drilled and explored by uranium development companies. And this is one of the ones that was, meaning that it would have been seen as a potentially economically viable uh, site for a mine. And again, here's a close-up of that. And then here, uh, here's the drawing that I did down here. So I currently have about six sheets of these done. And, uh, and my goal is to you know, keep going until I can't do this anymore and, and, and capture as many of the pipes as I can. So just recently, two weeks ago, uh, I did two rides uh, out very far west. Um, if you know where St. George, Utah is, I was basically due south of St. George, Utah. And I rode down a side canyon called Parashant Canyon. And in fact, do you remember the big news story? Actually, they were in the, in the news a couple of times. Remember the Bundys? Cly, uh, Clive Bundy, who kind of got into a little bit of a tiff with the federal government? Is that Oregon? Pardon? Oregon? Sorry? One was in Eastern Oregon, right? But before that incident, there was one uh, near St. George uh, that was, uh, didn't get quite as contentious, but uh, it, got, it was in the natural, national news for a couple of weeks. So the Bundys actually settled this portion of the Grand Canyon in the very early 20th century. And there are still ranches on the rim uh, just north of the, where this map ends up here. Uh, where they still, you know, they don't live there full time anymore, but they go out there during uh, probably the spring and fall roundup and moving the herd season. And in fact, my friend Bruce, who I've done a lot of these rides with, talked to three of them when we were in Parashant Canyon. They were down there repairing some of their water works, and there were three generations. And it was pretty cool. There was a fellow who was in his 80s, there was his son who was in his 40s, and then uh, his son who was eight years old. And I didn't get to talk to them, but I thought, it was, I thought it was a pretty neat thing to see. So we rode down Parashant Canyon, and our goal was uh, this pipe called the Chapel slash Puma slash Parashant pipe. And this is the road down. So there's actually quite a good road down here, and there's, there are very few roads that actually go into the Grand Canyon, and this is one of them. I think this is actually me on the road. And we're going to go all the way out here. And the road actually goes quite a bit further out around this, this ridge, and another five or six miles. And this is what the, what the, the, what the, the bottom of Parashant Canyon looks like. And this is very typical of the side canyons in the western Grand Canyon. They're very broad um, and kind of horizontal in nature as opposed to the more vertical quality of the central canyon. 
And this is the pipe that we were heading towards. This is the Parashant pipe. And this one is actually very visible. You can see how it's a little bit yellowish in here. So that's, a, that's staining from a mineral called limonite. Uh, this is my friend Bruce. And so we kind of clambered around there and found some artifacts. This, is, this had been drilled in the 1950s also by an energy company, but deemed not economically viable. And then the next day we, we did a ride out what's called Whit to what, what's called Whitmore Point. Has anybody done a river trip in the Grand Canyon? Oh my God. Oh, Karen, you have, all right. Uh, and Jane, did you? Okay. So if you, if you well, for, those, for you then, uh, do you remember after you went through Lava Falls, you passed by a big fall of lava that kind of cascaded over the rim of the canyon? So that place is Whitmore Wash. Oops. Oop, 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 oop. That's Whitmore Wash. Uh, this portion of the Grand Canyon was subject to really extensive uh, volcanic activity about two million years ago. And there are large extent, ex ex expanses of lava flows in this part of the canyon. And in some cases, they actually flowed over the rim of the canyon almost as a waterfall. So we rode, out, uh, we rode out this ridge to Whitmore Point. And again, to kind of illustrate the subtle nature of these features, can you see the breccia pipe here? Or the, the depression? So up here, there's a little circular depression. So that's the, that's the surface expression of the pipe. And then you can also see, see how the strata dips down here? So that dipping strata, again, is the result of that collapse you know, below ground. And here's the artist at work out at Whitmore Point. And one of, the, one of the great things about, again, this portion of the canyon is because it's so broad, when you go out to the points, you have these incredible panoramic views. Uh, you know, you, it's, it's just really, it's, it's a very different sort of canyon than it is where the hotels are. And as I was putting this slide talk together, I thought, I, I, I mean, I had to put a picture of myself at work, right? Um, and I put this slide in here, this, this photograph into the presentation, and then I realized, oh my gosh, there is this great masterpiece of 19th century Grand Canyon art by a fellow named William Henry Holmes. Have you ever seen this drawing before? This is, a, this is actually a print made from drawings that William Henry Holmes did at a place called Point Sublime, which is on the North Rim. And his view from Point Sublime spans more than 180 degrees. So it's like this. And he probably spent about three or four days out there doing these drawings. And each drawing is on a, about a 30-inch 30, 30 sheet of paper. The original drawings are stupendous. The print's pretty good, too. But the neat thing about this print is that he included himself at work down here in the lower left. And looking over his shoulder is the geologist Clarence Dutton. And you can kind of imagine how Clarence Dutton here might be saying, by Jove, William, you got it. <laughs> so I kind of felt like William Henry Holmes there at work out at Whitmore Point. And then again, just to kind of give you a sense of the expanse of the Western Grand Canyon, this is, uh, this is a view from Whitmore Point looking more to the west, and then this is Parashot Canyon, where we were the previous day. And the breccia pipe that we visited is that little light spot right there. And you can see how the road continues out around here. And there, there was another mine out here. So most of the mining in the Grand Canyon region was for copper. And that was pretty well played out by the first decade of the 20th century. Partly because the ore in most places was not you know, very rich. And also because, as, as you might imagine, looking at this road, the transportation costs were really high, which uh, is a good thing for the Grand Canyon. 
So my journey with Tony, back to Tony, because that's why we're all here, isn't it? So my journey with Tony continues because this fall we'll be bringing, um, searching for a bigger subject to the Museum of Northern Arizona. And so uh, I'm looking forward to bringing more large Grand Canyon paintings to the museum, but I'm also looking forward to bringing some paintings of the Himalaya, which has been another favorite subject of mine, though I have yet to visit the Himalaya. So we'll be, uh, we'll be bringing Tony back to Flagstaff this fall in November. In conclusion, I was thinking about what Tony means to me and why Tony is an important artist in the 21st century. And I think that, you know, I was walking around looking at beauty before the, well, before my talk here. And there are a couple of really key quotes from Tony. And to paraphrase uh, and to kind of look at it from my perspective, I think that in the art world beginning, oh, let's say in the 1880s, just to pick a date, at some point beauty became very uncool. And I've never thought that beauty was uncool. And I think that when one studies art, when one goes to art school or one goes to a university, it's almost trained out of you that beauty's not cool, that you've got to be serious and you've got to, you've got to show some angst, you've got to show some <laughs> concern for social welfare and you know, other things which are certainly important. But in the last century, beauty has kind of been left behind. And thinking about the, the other artist that I'm working on, Gunnar Wiedforst, the Swedish watercolor painter, Gunnar lived his life searching for beauty. And one reason why he's not very well known today is because he was swimming upstream like a salmon trying to go spawn, swimming upstream against all the modernists and the, the modern movements that he was, you know, part of the greater uh, artistic milieu, you know, movements like cubism and fauvism and surrealism and et cetera, et cetera. And in the 1920s and 1930s, Gunnar was doing fantastically beautiful watercolor paintings as Tony is today. And he made a living, but he was also kind of on the fringe, you know? And I think that beauty is kind of underrated these days. Uh, I think that there is a place for beauty in art, uh, and I think it can be done without cliches, and I think it can be done without sentimentality. And I wouldn't characterize my art necessarily as beautiful, but I think that you know, what Tony, Tony brings is not only work that's beautiful and meaningful, but one that speaks to a larger ideal than simply a beautiful landscape. You know, there's substance, there's an underlying uh, substance and seriousness and an essence. You know, he's really about conveying the essence of places, uh, as am I. And I think that Tony is incredibly dedicated. Um, <laughs> I've never, um, what's his wife's name? Yeah. Anne. Anne has to be an incredibly patient person. Uh, because <laughs> I know that my wife is very patient and I know that she doesn't like having to put up that patience to deal with some of the things that I do. Um, the other thing about Tony that I really admire is his immersive process. You know, he really, he dives into the places where he works. He stays there for days at a time, you know, frequently. And and again, that shows, that's, that's in the results, that's in the end product. And I think too that that, that that idea of a sense of place and really what it means to be somewhere, um, we, we kind of lose track of that because oftentimes when we are places, we think about the next place we're going, don't we? Or we think about the last place we've been. You know, a, a vacation trip is often more about recording where we've been than it is about being and smelling and feeling and hearing the insects, the people, the plants, the wind, the sky, you know, all of the sensory information that we're designed to intake. Uh, and, and again, I think that, you know, Henry David Thoreau spoke about that very eloquently. 
And then finally, I think that all, what all of this kind of leads to is that what Tony is able to convey is very complex relationships, multidimensional relationships that today, I think a lot of artists turn to four-dimensional media like video and sound to capture. But Tony's doing it in a very age-old manner with watercolor paint and graphite pencils. And his little notations, which I love, I've always loved artwork where the artists make little comments like that. Um, and, and I started doing that also. So in my drawing, in, my, in the terrible photographs of my drawings, you couldn't see that I'm doing similar things, not as extensively as Tony, but you know, I record the latitude and longitude and the weather conditions and all that sort of thing. So I think that his ability to convey complexity in a very approachable manner is a real gift. And you know, you've probably seen this in other artists. Uh, I mean, it's not unique, but not a lot of artists can pull it off successfully. And I think you recognize it too in a good work of literature. You know, something that's written in a in an approachable way, uh, but still yet able to convey, you know, the essence of a complex subject. And I think that that helps to tell us, helps to inform us of who we are and where we are. Um, and, and thanks to Tony, we get to visit places that many of us won't ever get to go to. And I think that's my conclusion. Alan, thank you. Please join me.